record now, off the record. <laughs> I appreciate Andrew and his thematic songs. You know, I'm preaching this evening on loyalty. The first song tonight was Loyalty to Christ. And so good selection there. And then I appreciate the last one. That wasn't probably for me. That was more for Charlie. He's taking a trip to New York here in a couple of weeks. So he will not let me go one. So uh, anyway, if you folks would just give him a few tips. This is off the record, right, Charlie? You're not recording this, are you? You don't want anyone to hear this. But uh, if you would just help him out with just a few tips. I'm going to probably be working this week on writing just um, poetic proposals and uh, rhymes and words and things like that. So if you would like to help, and I know Brother John is, you know, a man of words and uh, eloquent. So what's Song it? Of Solomon. Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon. Yeah, okay. Yeah, maybe. Maybe you just read, some, just brush up on your, on your uh, phraseology and so forth this week. So he's new to this, you know. He's never proposed before, so you really, this is you know a daunting task. This is a big deal. So off the record, right, Charlie? We're not, like this is not getting out here. So don't anybody tell anybody anything, okay? But uh, <laughs> he's going to New York. What next weekend? The not this 30th. coming weekend, but the one after. Yeah. Thirtieth. All right, so y'all watch out for him. Make sure to, you know, get any good tips. And buy a ring first. That's my first tip. Okay. <laughs> and first Samuel 23. All right, enough messing around. But good, good selection there, Andrew. I saw what you did. The loyalty to Christ wife. for me. Oh, you did that this one. This is all the record. Thank okay. you, wife. Okay. All right. And then, oh, love that one. Let me go. Boy. <laughs> By the way, that song is, is about, about God. Charlie. First Corinthians, what? I said First Samuel. Did I say First Corinthians? No, no you said First Samuel. Samuel. Oh, sorry. I could have said First Corinthians no, if you told me that. I believe First Corinthians it. seventeen this morning. Well, I was going to be in a passage in First Corinthians and never got there. So we'll be there next week. Twenty-three, correct, Pastor? Yeah. What? Twenty-three, correct? Yes, First Samuel twenty-three. Since you reminded me about that, next Sunday morning, uh, be here for our Sunday school series. We began and didn't get too far, but we're kind of uh, adding on to our series on soul winning saturation and we're uh, I, I had so many questions after that series so many people came and said pastor uh, specifically I'd like you to talk about winning my Catholic friend or my Muslim friend or my whatever basically religious friend so we're doing a little series on how to preach the gospel to your religious friends to religious people and it's a little bit different uh, to preach the gospel to someone that is trusting something already for their salvation you know truthfully uh, I'm old enough to have come from a time period when most people were religious and you know you're really approaching the gospel with them from a standpoint of this is your religion but you must be born again and now today when you preach the gospel you have to tell them who God is that there is a such a matter as as the eternal life and you really are dealing with a, a completely different background who does God want to be saved religious people or unreligious people yes, yes he does he wants them both to be saved and so if we can be as practical as possible and so that would be a help then the other thing that I neglected to mention uh, everybody either was telling me the truth or was telling me what they thought I wanted them to tell me and they asked if I would show pictures from our missionaries of Paul journey and I have a lot of thoughts about the gospel to the Greek world uh, just from having that trip and some of the things that we saw and uh, it was really it was a very very enriching uh, a lot of spiritual experience so we're going to have next Sunday evening in the service I'm going to be sharing uh, just pictures of our trip places that we went and look at the spiritual significance of it and really it was a, is a help to understand the gospel to the Gentiles as well as to the Jews you know our New Testament's really in many ways written that way because Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles and yet there are, there are books in the New Testament that's really focusing on people their background is is Judaism or background is being Hebrews for instance a letter to the Hebrews or James a couple, several of the Gospels are really slanted to the mindset of the Hebrew people. But Paul was specifically called to be a, a Gospel preacher to the Gentiles. Now, the Gospel is Jesus, and the way to receive the Gospel or to be saved is always by faith. 
in Jesus Christ. But the, what people are thinking, the mindset, the background of people to see that they need Jesus, it's really, it's really helped too. Uh, so I, I hope that you'll come for that. I have some thoughts, and I believe it'll be real help for you. All right. Loyalty to Christ, 1 Samuel chapter 23. And I just want to talk this evening, when I want to uh, continue in this study uh, in uh, the transition period between the judges and the kings in Israel. And we want to just look at this matter this evening, specifically of loyalty. So let's read again, reading in verse 1. Then they told David, saying, Behold, the Philistines fight against Keilah, and they robbed the threshing floors. Therefore David inquired the Lord, saying, Shall I go and smite these Philistines? That's verse 2. And the Lord said unto David, Go and smite the Philistines and save Keilah. And David's men said unto him, Behold, we be afraid here in Judah. You like the way I read that? How much more than if we come to Keilah against the armies of the Philistines? Then David inquired of the Lord yet again, and the Lord answered and said, Arise, go down to Keilah, for I will deliver the Philistines in thine hand. So David and his men went to Keilah and fought with the Philistines and brought away their cattle and smote them with great slaughter. So David saved the inhabitants of Keilah. Now, if you will look down to verse 12, uh, actually verse 9, David knew that Saul secretly practiced mischief against him, and he said to Abiathar the priest, Bring hither the ephod. Then said David, O Lord God of Israel, thy servant hath certainly heard that Saul seeketh to come to Keilah to destroy the city for my sake. Will the men of Keilah deliver me up into his hand? Will Saul come down as thy servant hath heard? O Lord God of Israel, I beseech thee, tell thy servant. And the Lord said, He will come down. Then said David, Will the men of Keilah deliver me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, They will deliver thee up. Now let's pray. Father, please help us this evening as we look at this matter of loyalty. God, I pray that you'd help our mindsets with it. We pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. Now is that betrayal or what? How, how do you like that? The Philistines are coming down. They are robbing you. They're stealing your cattle. They're stealing your crops. They're, they are tormenting you. And David and his men, by the will of God, come and help deliver you, drive the Philistines away, get you back your cattle, get you back your possessions, and protect you, provide you protection and then remain with you. Now, I don't know about you, but for this city, this is an upgrade in citizenship. Isn't it? I mean, should, oughtn't any city be happy to have a band of men that are unafraid of the Philistines? Philistines are warriors. They had the technology of the day, and uh, they were marauding uh, seamen, and they were, they were individuals to be greatly feared. And so having someone that firstly was not afraid of the Philistines, but secondly was a nationalist like David. David loved his nation, loved his country. Yeah, have you ever just sat down and just thought about how seriously David took his calling, his anointing to be king of Israel? He took it very seriously. But he was a nationalist before that. See, David loved God, and he understood that the nation of Israel was special in the eyes of God, didn't he? Remember, remember his attitude toward Goliath? What was his mindset when Goliath was challenging the armies of God? Who is this Philistine? Who? What is that? Defying the armies of the living God. And David had, had a big God. God was real. David knew God. And the fact that God was the king of Israel. Do you remember, uh, we, we, we've been there, and it's been a little while, but remember when Israel said, we want a king. And, uh, of course, they weren't supposed to have a king. They rejected Samuel, and they, they had good reasons, humanly speaking, but God could have given them a good judge and a good high priest just because Samuel's sons weren't good men. God could have, God could have taken care of that, but they wanted a king, and God told Samuel, they haven't rejected you, they, they've rejected me. Then we went through the whole process of seeing Saul being given to Israel as their king. And then after the first great victory, do you remember when the people who had complained about Saul repented? And then God had Samuel come and give the children of Israel a message. Do you remember the gist of that message? 
This is why we review things. <laughs> Remember the gist of the message? Remember this? You didn't want me to be your king. You wanted a human king. But basically the, it was this. Now you have a king. He's going to tax you. He's going to take daughters from you. And he's my anointed. And I'm still your God. And you're still going to answer to me. Remember that? It was God said, hey, you have your king. But just because you have a king for an authority, you have an under authority, doesn't mean I'm still not your authority. I'm still your God. And so David understood that God was the, God was the king of Israel. He loved his nation, loved his country. And so, do you think the men at Keilah knew about David and Goliath? Is there anyone in the world that didn't know about David and Goliath? And he came to live with them. Didn't, didn't only come to live with them, David came and delivered them. And I just think, you know, this is a real upgrade in our citizenship here in our nation. You know, we have a special guy here living with us. Humanly speaking, could we all agree that there would have been good reason for the men of this city to be loyal to David? Sure. Amen. Of course. Anybody disagree with that? Could we agree as well that not being loyal to David was just cowardice? I don't read this account and think, you know, they're good people, but you know, you have to understand. Now listen, the world thinks this way, don't they? The world today thinks along the lines of, well, you know, if it doesn't cost anything or if there's no harm that comes to you, you know, then do something for somebody. But you've got to take care of yourself first. The whole matter of sacrifice seems to be a, a gone notion in our society. By the way, uh, did y'all read the news last week about our new sheriff in Broward County? Did y'all see the article last week, what happened? He was driving, I think it was down, I think it was down Broward Boulevard, and a man had robbed a, I don't know if it was a 7-Eleven store, but some type of a convenience store, and was running down the street, and the uh, sheriff, our sheriff was being driven in a car, and he saw a man running down the street, and the clerk chasing him, and he had his driver pull over, and he ran the guy down and caught him and arrested him. Thank God we've got a sheriff with some guts now in Broward County Amen. instead of the coward he had before. Yes. Uh, you know, I was really happy about that. Okay. Uh, but we actually had a sheriff with, you know, I'm tired of the whole see, say, see it something, say something mentality. Saying something mm -hmm. doesn't do anything about the problem. I'm glad we have a sheriff that didn't document it. Yeah, I saw it. Let me make a report. And he actually ran the guy down and caught him. He said, you know, I'm really glad I, I uh, work out regularly and stay in shape. You know, like, well, good. We got a, we've got a good sheriff, and I, I just I like that. I, I think in a sheriff, that's what you you ought to expect from leadership. And I guarantee the department's going to get a lot better in Broward County with that kind of leadership. But uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> I admire courage, courageous people. You know, it's a little discouraging thing, though, isn't it, to be to to put your life on the line for people and they're not loyal to you. And that's what David did. Uh, we know David, uh, at this time in his life, really hadn't done anything like murder Uriah or commit adultery or uh, you know ruin his children at this stage in his life. And so you really don't have anything that you could say about David. Well, you know, David's not a great king or he's not a great man or anything like that. He was a great man. He was being unfairly hunted by King Saul, whom he was still loyal to. When I think of David's situation, he's living with people whom he has provided protection for, whom he has recovered their personal property for, uh, to whom he has been loyal. And he asks God the question, God, will Saul come? Yes, he'll come. Okay, that's a problem. The second question, will the people in the city turn me over to Saul? Yes, they will. How devastating that must be. You'll be betrayed in your life by men. You will. You'll be betrayed in your life 
by men. And I watch, I've watched many instances of betrayal where individuals wrong other individuals or they don't stand with individuals. Many times we call for people to make great stands, but we don't commend them when they do. Or when they stand, we retreat from them and they stand alone. And, you know, that's cowardly. It's cowardice. Uh, there are issues today that need to be clearly defined by God-fearing people and publicly so that there is no question with individuals that just want to know what does God think about it, that they can have clarity about it. I appreciated Franklin Graham. I'm not a fan, per se, of Franklin Graham, but I appreciated a few weeks ago when he tweeted uh, to the homosexual man running for office and really parading that and saying that he's a Christian. And he said, you know what? God condemns homosexuality, and that's something to repent for, not to use for a campaign. And, uh, you know, I stand with Franklin Graham when he does things like that. You know, he's not uh, necessarily a fundamentalist, and he's not uh, right where we're at on a lot of things. But as far as that goes, man, good for Franklin Graham. And you know what? I'll, re I'll repost his tweet. <laughs> you know, I'll say, yes, yeah, sure. You know what? He's absolutely right about that. And you say, well, Pastor, but, but I have uh, people that are involved in that lifestyle who are in my family. Yeah, you know what? Uh, you need to let your family know what God thinks about it because He's the one who will judge them. That's right. And they can be delivered, but they won't be delivered without clarity on it. We need people that stand. And any issue, any matter, moral issues, it's incredible how many Christians agree silently. Uh, this is... This is political, and, it, it, and I don't care what your political persuasion is. I'm not promoting or trying to get political on you this evening at all. But the exit polls in the 2016 presidential election did not reflect the actual vote. There's a discrepancy in the exit polls. You know why? Because there are people that wanted to vote for President Trump, but when they were interviewed, they said they didn't. Democrat men, if you want to know who it was. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> they said, no, no, I voted for Hillary. Ugh. But the actual polls show that they lied to the exit polls. Mm -hmm. Why? Well, because they're cowards. I right? I mean, you know, I'm not here saying you should have voted for President Trump. You know, that was a pretty dicey deal in 2016. He had no track record. No, He had a bad track record, but not a good one. Right? I mean, never done anything good or moral in his life. And uh, so, you know, that's not my point this evening. What I'm saying is if you did something, stand. Have enough courage to say that you did. And so these, these individuals, these men from Kyla, Kyla, a bunch of cowards. David's delivered them, and they have every reason to be loyal to him. At the very least, they ought to say, you know what, we don't think we can defeat Saul's army, but we'll hide you. Or, here's the deal, David, but they were going to betray him. And all I want to say to you is that this is one of the major tools that Satan uses to defeat good people. Discouragement because of disloyalty. Discouragement because of disloyalty. And here we see a textbook biblical example of an individual that responded to betrayal in the very best way. First of all, there's that little caveat, we've already looked at this, of when Jonathan goes uh, to meet David. Saul is hunting for David, and the Bible says, Jonathan arose and went to meet him in the wood. That always, that's always laughable to me. Saul can't find him anywhere, and Jonathan goes, oh, hey, David, how are you doing? He's Saul's son. It's like, Jonathan knows right where he is the whole time, or he could, he could find him just like that. You know why Jonathan was able to find David? Loyalty. Jonathan was loyal to David, and David would have said, you see Jonathan, tell him where I'm at. Tell Jonathan I'm over here. He didn't have to worry about Jonathan betrayal, because Jonathan wouldn't have betrayed him, because right. Jonathan was a man. He was a loyal man. You see. I shouldn't say things like Jonathan was a man. You know what? If Jonathan were a woman and were loyal, she'd be a loyal woman, right? It's, 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 gender doesn't have to do with it. You know, there are people that gender-wise, they are men, but they don't have loyalty, and so they're cowards. Jonathan was no coward. He was loyal. He was a good man. He was a loyal man. And I just want to look at uh, David's response. I don't know about you, but I read uh, at times, and I see David 
becoming discouraged as he's fleeing from King Saul. Go down to chapter 23 and look with me, if you would, to verse 19. Now it says, Then came up the Ziphites to Saul, to Gibeah, saying, Doth not David hide himself with us in strong wood holds in the wood in the hill of Hekilah, which is on the south of Jeshimon? Now you folks have been to Israel. You ever been there? You have you been to this place, John? This uh, Hekilah, which is on the south of Jeshimon? I didn't go there specifically, no. But you went in the area, in the region, in the area. It's not a real big region around in that in that area. But it'd be interesting is I don't really have a point of reference of how much space it is. But what we're seeing here are some pretty specific details on where David is. And specific enough that it's worthwhile for Saul to say, okay, I ought to go there because I've got a really great chance of capturing David. Now, who was it that told Saul this? Well, it's the Ziphites. It was the people that he was living in the mountain old in the wilderness of Ziph around. And so the very people that he's living around betrayed him. Yeah, you see a recurring theme here? Uh, in verse 21, listen to Saul. Blessed be ye of the Lord, for ye have compassion on me. Go, I pray you, prepare yet, and know and see his place where his haunt is, and who has seen him there, for it is told me that he dealt very subtly. Yeah, that's no kidding. See therefore and take knowledge of all the lurking places where he hideth himself, Come ye again to me with a certainty, and I'll go with you. And it shall come to pass, if he be in the land, that I will search him out through all the thousands of Judah. Saul said, If he's there, I'll find him. And the Bible says, They arose and went to Ziph before Saul. But David and his men were in the wilderness of Maon, in the plain of the south of Jeshimon. Saul also and his men went to seek him. They told David, Wherever he came down into a rock, and abode in the wilderness of Maon, and when Saul heard that, he pursued after David in the wilderness of Maon. Saul went on this side of the mountain, and David and his men on that side of the mountain. Now that's pretty nip and tuck, isn't it? I mean, like literally, there. It's like you ever. Uh, I had a raccoon do this to me one time. I uh, I was wearing shorts and cowboy boots. It was the middle of the night, and I was sleeping, and this raccoon kept getting on the top of our house, and. And uh, he would get, he would break into our screened-in ports. This is when we lived in Delray Beach. And I got up in the middle of the night, and put cowboy boots on because you don't want to kick a raccoon barefoot. And uh, what's that? Yeah, it was a raccoon. Yeah, it was a raccoon. And so I chased him around the front yard, and I remember that raccoon getting behind a tree and looking at me like this. You know, I go to this side, and he gets on, and looks like this. And uh, he stopped bothering me after that night. By the way, he never did it again. But I remember him going on this side and this side. And I could just kind of in my mind's eye imagine, you know, David and his men, they're on this side of the mountain and Saul's on this side and they're going around. And, you know, <laughs> it, you know, maybe while they're turning a corner, somebody catches a glimpse of somebody, but they're just kind of playing chase around the mountain. And uh, Saul didn't catch David, but he'd been betrayed twice. He'd been betrayed at this time by the folks at and he'd been betrayed by the folks at Ziph. And here's what I want to get to this evening. Uh, and this really fits with our theme song. Verse 27, But there came a messenger unto Saul, saying, Haste the income, for the Philistines have invaded the land. Wherefore Saul returned from pursuing after David and went against the Philistines. Therefore they called that place Selah Hama Lekoth. And David went up from thence and dwelt in strongholds at En Gedi. Now let's stop here and let's, uh, you know, you're not interested in long Hebrew word studies, I don't think, this evening. But let's just stop here for just a second and draw a quick conclusion. Because you need to know this, folks. You don't need men to be loyal to you in order for God to take care of you. And that's just the truth. David <clears throat> did everything right in the places where he lived. He treated the people right. He provided protection for them. Remember what happened with Nabal? Mm -hmm. he, 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 he protected, he took care of, and he was continually betrayed by men. And you know what? If you don't realize that that's the way life is, you're going to be really disappointed sometime because people will betray you. I'm not being a cynic here this evening. 
I'm not saying, oh, you know, every person's a, you ever met the every person's bad people, you know? I've met cops like that. Everybody's a criminal. You know, even the cops are criminals. I'm just like, man, I wouldn't be a cop if I thought that. You know, if you don't think there's good and that there's justice, man, that's a little negative. You ever met somebody just everybody is a fake, everybody's a phony, and everybody's... Well, that isn't true either. Jonathan wasn't. Jonathan was a good friend. And David had some men that stood by him, and they were good friends. They were loyal friends. And so, just a little bit of insight for you this evening. First of all, don't focus on the disloyal. There are a lot of disloyal people in the world. People that, you can't even say they're loyal to themselves. You just have to say they're cowards. You know, they may put their own best interests first, but they may not even do that because they're just cowards. They might be in Christianity. We don't demand loyalty in Christianity, though, do we? You ever, uh, you ever been seen where uh, a, a Christian leader demands loyalty? Unquestioning loyalty? You know, God doesn't teach that anywhere, does He? But you know who David was loyal to? Well, we could, we, could, we could say a lot of people, couldn't we? Was David loyal to Saul? Yes. Yeah, he was. Why? Because he's loyal to God. That's why. David was loyal to Saul. And the reason he was loyal to Saul was because Saul was God's anointed. And you know, that's a pretty good perspective, isn't it? I'm not loyal to you per se. It's not that I'm disloyal to you, but my, my cause for my loyalty to you is not because of anything you've done for me. It's because of who God is. Why do you think, why do you suppose Jonathan was loyal to David? Because, because he's he loyal God's, to God. He was right? God's anointed too. Yeah. David was God's anointed, and Jonathan said, I know God's, I know that you're going to be the king of Israel. I know it's God's plan. And I'm going to be, I'm going to be your, your number one servant. I'll be, I'm going to be right there. I'm going to serve you as king of Israel, David. The very man that Saul perceived was replacing his son. His son realized God had put in that place. And David and Saul, Jonathan just said, hey, if that's what God wants, that's what I want. David was loyal to God. And you know, when Saul was really, really close, they're chasing him around the mountain, and it's getting really, really close, nip and tuck. It's just a matter of a foot race at this point in time, and maybe a trick or a trap. Then God sends somebody to tell Saul, oh, the Philistines have raided, and Saul's gone. Why? Well, because if your loyalty to if your loyalty is to God, my friend, God can take care of you. Now, before we finish with that thought, let's go back a little bit. Could God have taken care of the men in the city of Keilah if they'd been loyal? See, God could have taken care of David there. Could God have taken care of David in the wilderness of Ziph? Sure, He could. God could anywhere. So why was it that David was in this place? Well, because David was surrounded by people who had no loyalty. You know, if I could, if I could be used of God to instill thoughts that God could develop into something, it would be that we need, we need a generation that has some courage. I'm sad to see the great generation dying off in America and the United States because they really were a courageous generation, weren't they? You know, one of my all-time favorite quotes is, is uh, by John F. Kennedy. You know which one, right? Ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. I'm not a Kennedy fan. Are you? Well, I don't care if you are. You don't have to tell me. All right. <laughs> I mean, the guy was a, a bootleg and leg and uh, uh, mafia member, but the reality of it is that he understood something about loyalty, and we've lost it in our generation. We just we're a generation of cowards. It's a tragedy, isn't it, that some some uh, coward can go into a place and shoot it up, and everybody runs. In the few cases where there are courageous people, it doesn't go that way, does it? It usually ends very quickly. And if I could instill in, in our people I, I, some examples, we see here a Bible example of individuals that understand, hey, you can be courageous and you can be loyal, and if your courage and loyalty 
if the focus of those is because of who God is and your relationship with Him, God can take care of you. And that's the best case scenario. Now, I don't want to go on and on, but what happened to Keilah after David left? Historically, we know they were plundered and the city was destroyed. Now, I, I'm not saying that wouldn't have happened by now, but that's what happened when David left. I don't know about the Ziphites. know what happened there. But if I had to take my guess, I think they'd have been safer with David haunting their caves and lurking in those places, as Saul put it, than they were with him in other places. And so you could be loyal to God and not worry about being loyal to man. You could be loyal to God and not worry about men being loyal to you. One more thought. Thank you. If you were David and the Kenites or the Ziphites betrayed you, what condition would you leave the city in? <laughs> Good thing you. So Sophia's not David. She'd have burned it down. You know? Right? <laughs> Think on this, though. What's it? What do you feel like when people are disloyal to you? You know what David did? You know what David did when they were disloyal to him? Walked away. He left. He left. He said, "Well, this is not a safe place. I'm out of here." And when he left, the man with God's anointing left. You see, and they lost something. He could have burned the place down. They, would, they, they were cowards. They couldn't have stopped him. Right? He could have said, you know what? These cattle, I found them. I'm taking them with me. They couldn't have stopped him. But you know what he did? He left. He just said, okay. That's what it is. And he left. He went to Ziph. And they were disloyal to him. And he left. So what it is. Christian, why don't you try that sometime when people betray you? Walk away? Just walk away and let God handle it. Because that's precisely what God did. And God will do it. Every time. Be loyal to God. Thank you. Father, thank You. Thank You for Your Word. And I just ask that You would help us to practically remember it so we can apply it when given the opportunity. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. More than we know.